Hey guys, welcome to the video lecture and let's get started right away. Alright, so today we are going to be doing lesson 2.2 which is translations, transformations, reflections of exponential functions and compound interest payments. So let's go ahead and get started. Alright, I wanted to go over this one more time since some of you are first to watch this. Um, we have to make sure we take notes so you have to take copious notes. I will be giving you guys a quiz on this when we come in tomorrow. So I do expect you to have notes so you're able to use for those quizzes. Uh, get in the zone, so make sure you're not doing anything else while watching this. I shouldn't have to review too much in class. You should be able to apply what you've learned from this video in class tomorrow. And three, it's on YouTube, so pause it, rewind it, and replay it if needed. All right. First, we're going to go into translation. So this is translations of exponential functions. So remember, an exponential function would look like this, where you'd have some number, and then the variable would be in the exponent. Very important that the variable is in the exponent. That's what makes it an exponential function. Now, we've done translations before with graphs like f of x equals 3x. For example, if we ever had something like this, and we had x plus 2 squared, remember that plus 2 would move my graph to the left. All right, we're going to do the same thing with exponential functions. The only thing is, where's my variable? Well, my variable is clearly in my exponent. So whenever I add or subtract within my function, right next to that variable in the exponent, that's when I'm going to move left or right. And the same rules apply. I'm going to move left if I add. I'm going to move right if I subtract. All right, so you should be copying this down right here. And again, the same rules work for up and down. So remember before I would have, say, my parent function would be x squared. I would have x squared, and then I'd add outside of that parent function. So I'd add a 2 over here, and that would move my graph up. It would shift it up. Well, the same thing is going to happen with exponential functions. See, in exponential functions, you'll maybe have something like f of x equals 3x, 3 to the x, and then your plus 2 will be on the outside of your function, meaning it will not be up there in the exponent, it will be out here. And that will tell me to move it up. And these are the two ways I can remember these. So these are the two formal ways we write this in math. You need to make sure you copy this down, all right? All right. Transformations. So transformations, you guys had quite a bit of trouble with last time. So same thing happens with transformations. When we have horizontal transformations, that's when we multiply within the function. So that's the first thing we do. So if the first thing we do is multiply that variable and we do no other function to it, that's when it's going to be horizontal. Now, that's, for example, when we have a problem like f of x equals 3, and then, remember, 3 is our base, so if we have to the 4x, notice that that x is not alone, it's being multiplied by that 4, and it's being directly multiplied, nothing else is happening to this before that. So that 4 is actually going to transform this horizontally. Now, how is it going to transform it horizontally? Well, I have to look at my rules. If a is greater than 1, then I am going to compress horizontally. If a is between 0 and 1, if it's a fraction, if it's a decimal that's less than 1, I'm going to expand it. Well, clearly 4 is greater than 1, so I'm going to compress this. And how am I going to compress it? I'm going to compress it horizontally because it's being multiplied directly by that x. All right, my other type, my other type should be vertical transformations. Vertical. So vertical transformations. Now with vertical transformations, we multiply on the outside of a function. So whereas before we multiply directly by the variable, vertically it's going to be the second thing we do. So one way to look at this is if I have that same f of x equals, say I had 3 is my base, x is my exponent, that's my variable. If I multiply outside of this, if I multiply outside of this, then I'm going to have a vertical compression. And a vertical compression will 
I'm sorry, a vertical expansion because a is greater than 1. And notice, the 3 is the base of my exponential function. I'm not doing anything with this 3 and this x. This is my base. What's actually transforming is the 4. That 4 is doing it. And that 4 is expanding it. It's expanding it because it's greater than 1. All right. This is a handy chart. Um, I'm not going to go too much over it because it's just what we just covered. But um, it's you need to write this down in your notes. I wrote it down for you before, but it's a nice uh, guide for you. So if we're going to multiply a variable, the first thing we're going to do if, would be horizontal. If it's the, multiplying the first thing we do, it's horizontal. And what is it going to be? Well, if a is greater than 1, we're going to compress it. If a is between 0 and 1, we're going to expand it. Now, if it's the second thing we multiply by, so if it's on the outside of the function, if we multiply the parent function by the entire parent function by that number, then it's going to be, if a is greater than 1, it's going to be vertically expanded. And if a is between 0 and 1, if that number is between 0 and 1, it's going to be vertically compressed. So make sure to write this down, pause the video, write it down, because this is a very, very handy flowchart. All right, reflections work much in the same way. With reflections, we have a y-axis reflection, which is when we multiply negative within the function. So with traditional functions, this would be if we had something like negative x and then we squared it. That would be an example of a y-axis reflection. Notice over here, the negative sign is up in the exponent. It's next to the variable in the exponent. Now, if we had something like this, Notice that is an x-axis reflection, so it's going to go over the x-axis because my negative is outside of my function. So in this case, notice my negative is on the outside of my function. It's not up there in the exponent next to the variable, it's on the outside. So let's look at a couple examples before we move on. We have a function called g of x equals 2 to the x plus 1, and we want to see what has happened here. Well, our original parent function is going to be 2x because 2 acts as the base and x acts as our exponent. So we have a variable in our exponent. We know it's an exponential function. And now we want to see what has happened to it. How has it shifted? Well, we've added 1 directly to our variable. We've added 1. So if it's within our parent function, which we've added 1, we remember that, okay, we're going to shift it. And if we're adding 1, that means we're going to be going to the left. And we're going to be going to the left how many units? One unit. And I have a little graph over here that shows you this was my original function. And notice it moved to the left one. All right, very important. All right, next function is h of x equals 2 to the negative x. So in this case, we want to see what's going on, what's different. Well, I can immediately identify my parent function. 2 is my base, and my variable is in my exponent. So my parent function is going to be 2 to the x. And I want to know, well, when I multiply directly by a negative number up in the exponent, what does that do to my function? Well, as we talked about before, if it's within the parent function, then that's going to reflect it over the y-axis. And in the image, you can clearly see that we started out with my parent function of 2 to the x, and then it was flipped over the y-axis. My next example is i of x equals negative 3 times 2 to the x. Now we have to be very careful here. First, let's identify our parent function. Our parent function is 2 to the x. Now, what are we doing to that 2 to the x? Well, we're multiplying it by a negative 3. So first, let's identify that we've multiplied it by a negative. Have we multiplied the parent function directly by the negative? Meaning, is it being directly multiplied by the variable? Or is it on the outside? Is the entire function being multiplied by a negative? Well, it's clear that it's on the outside. It's being multiplied by the entire function. Therefore, it's going to be reflected over the x-axis. Now, what is this number? Well, it's a 3, 
And is it being multiplied directly by x? Is that the first operation that is happening with x? Well, no, it's on the outside. In fact, it's going to be 2 to the x, and then only after we find 2 to the x, then we're going to multiply by 3. So it's not the first thing we do. It's at least the second thing. At the very earliest, the second thing. So if it's not the first, then it's the second. Therefore, it's a vertical. And, well, a is greater than 1. This number is greater than 1. 3 is clearly greater than 1. Therefore, it will be a vertical expansion. A vertical expansion. And this is a tricky problem, so make sure you know how to master this before you move on from this next slide. All right, our next sections we're going to be covering is we've been really concentrating on applying these exponential functions. Last class, we looked at exponential growth and exponential decay. And now we're going to look at interest payments. So before we do that, we got to tighten up our financial literacy. So I have a few vocab words which you need to write down in your notes. The first is interest. Interest is money paid to a lender in exchange for use of his money. So often you guys go into a bank and you deposit money into uh, an account. Now you gain interest on that account, meaning that you gain money for keeping money in the bank. May, some of you may be confused at this, like why are they paying me money to keep my money there? But that's because the bank actually is using that money that you're putting in to lend it to other people. So you're actually giving the bank money when you put it in the account and you're gaining interest off it because you're allowing the bank to use it and that's your fee for allowing the bank to use it. Number two, appreciate. So appreciate is to rise in value. To depreciate is to fall in value. If ever we refer to anything happening in an annual cycle, that means it occurs once a year. A semi-annual cycle is twice a year and quarterly means four times a year. Think of it like a quarter. Four quarters in a dollar, it occurs four times. So this is going to be our compound interest formula, which you need to write down. Our compound interest formula is A equals P times 1 plus R divided by N to the NT. Our A stands for our accrued total. That means that's our total amount. In the end, that's going to be our total amount of money. Our P is our principal payment. When you refer to principal payment, that's another way of saying that is initial amount. So our initial amount is P. Then we have 1 plus R divided by N. R is going to be our interest rate. So whatever interest rate we get from our bank. And N is the number of times per year our interest is compounded. So if I have an annual rate, that means it's only going to be compounded once per year. If it's a biannual rate or a semi-annual rate, that means it's going to be compounded two times per year. And notice that n is in both my denominator for r and it's in my exponent. So we're going to be using it in two places. And time, we're going to keep time in years for now. So let's try applying this. Make sure you write, write this down. All right, Mr. Vedi invests $2,000 in a certified deposit, which pays him an annual interest rate of 3%. So my principal amount, my initial amount, is going to be $2,000. My interest rate, my R, is going to be 0 0.03. And my times it will pay me, well, it pays me annually. So if it pays me annually, annually, that means it only pays me one time per year. So my n is the number of times it pays me per year. It only pays me once. So remember, my formula was A equals P times 1 plus R divided by N to the NT. All right. Now, it asked me to write an exponential function to represent this data. Well, I'm going to plug in my 2,000 for P. I'm going to plug in my 0 0.03 for R, and I'm going to plug in my 1 for N. So what I should get is N equals 2,000 times 1 plus 0 0.03 divided by 1, notice I put them in parentheses, to the 1 times T, because it only pays me one time per year. 
all right? And if I plug this in my calculator afterwards, it tells me that how much money will Mr. Vedi have if he keeps his money in the certified deposit for 10 years? And so we're assuming that I don't touch that money at all. It just stays in there for 10 years. Well, we plug in 10 for t because t is number of years. And we should get, if I type in my calculator, n equaling $2,687 and 83 cents. All right. So let's try one more pretty quickly. Let's say I invest $2,000 in a certified deposit, which pays a biannual interest rate of 3%. Notice the difference here is that it pays biannually or semi-annually. That means it's going to pay me two times per year. Well, let's see what has changed. My principal amount is the same, my interest is the same, but as I said before, it pays me two times per year. So I'm going to have n equals 2. Now my next question asks me, write an exponential function to represent this data. So I have n equals 2000, remember that's my principal, times 1 plus 0 0.03, which is my interest rate, divided by 2, the number of times my interest accru accrues, to the 2, that's my n, t, the time in years. All right. How much money will Mr. Vedi have if he keeps his money in this certified deposit for 10 years? So I have my equation written out. And now I know to plug in 10 for t. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly, in my calculator, cal write this, type this all out. So it's going to be 2,000 times 1 plus parentheses 0 0.03 divided by 2 raised to the, well, what's my t going to be? My t is going to be 10. So that's going to be 2 times 10, which is going to be 20, to the 20. And I get $2,693.71. All right? All right, I'll see you tomorrow in class. And remember, make sure you took very good notes and rewind the video if needed. See you guys. Thank you.